Hello, hello everyone. So good to see you today. It is a wonderful day to jump right in to Ezekiel chapter 7. And I found another wonderful um, little history kind of summary of the book of Ezekiel. And I wanted to read it to you as I was studying it last night and looking up all my um, maps and what's modern day versus what is uh, what is showing during that time. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that I grabbed today to use, of course, is my Art Scrolls uh, Tanakh series, but also this wonderful, the Israel Bible that uh, my son Harry gave me. And I'm really enjoying reading from this. It reads uh, like identical to the uh, Tanakh series, um, the Art Scroll. It's written in Hebrew and then translated in English directly from the Hebrew. So I'll be reading from that today, but also wanted to read you this introduction. And before I jump into that and giving everyone a chance to join us, hi Patricia, uh, only because I know I did not tell you I would be here today. So uh, if you are in the Goodyear, Arizona area, please join us uh, this coming weekend, Saturday. I'll be doing a ladies luncheon at 10 a.m. and then Sunday we will be doing service at the River Church AZ in Goodyear, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And then the following Sunday we will be with Pastors Larry and Kathy Eberhardt in Gainesville, Texas. A lot of times we'll see Kathy right on here with us and um, we will be with them for their 1030 Sunday service. I believe that's February the 5th. And then if you watch Daystar, I hope you do, uh, I'll, we will be with our friend Joni Lamb on their live uh, Ministry Today show Tuesday. I think it airs several different times. It'll be live in the morning. And then um, we'll be taping Table Talk and I'll be taping a show with Rebecca. And so it'll be a great day. And um, so let's jump into some prayer requests really quick, giving everyone a chance to come in. Hi, Laura. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, DJ. Hi, Tony. Hi, Janice. Hi, Sunny. Um, here we are. Tiffany is asking for prayer for Mark and Julie. Uh, Mark had a kidney transplant uh, years ago and recently has had to stop the anti-rejection drugs and it's having serious side effects. So let's pray for Mark that his body will not reject this kidney transplant and that all these issues settle down in the name of Jesus and leave his body uh, <clears throat> Pray for Leanne, uh, that's uh, Tiffany's daughter. Tiffany's mom's wound is almost completely healed and she's driving again. Great testimony. Thank you, Tiffany, for sharing a good testimony too. Uh, pray for, oh, she said, Tiffany's had surgery and it's been a huge success and uh, continue to pray for no complications of any kind. It's a healing process of months. So we continue to pray for that and complete healing for you, Tiffany. Isabel uh, has uh, gender identity issues. Uh, she has a wounded heart. And so we pray for Isabel to find the Lord who can straighten out all of our identity issues and put us right position with him. I am a worshiper of God because of Jesus Christ who lives inside of me and the Holy Spirit who is housed inside of me. Glory to God. My, all my issues are settled at the cross and then through the cross and at the feet of Jesus as I worship him. Uh, I, Van is usually with us. I'm looking for him right now joining us. He asked his mom to set up a partnership. Thank you, Van. You are so precious. Van Dotson, his mom, Karen, um, set up a partnership with us. I so appreciate that. And I so appreciate you, Van, and all your studies and your desire to walk with God and be used by him. Wendy Gillespie is asking for prayer for her daughter, Gabrielle Anderson, who's been diagnosed with breast cancer, and it's stage one. So we pray right now in the name of Jesus, Wendy, for your daughter, Gabrielle, to be healed and whole. And cancer, we are not afraid of you. Uh, Pastor Dave Kokenauer has proven that. He is not afraid. We are not afraid of cancer. We push through Connie Costley's son, Danny. We command every cancer cell that I just named in those names and also in names that are unnamed. But Gabrielle, Pastor Dave, 
uh, Danny, and so many others, no cancer can live in your body in the name of Jesus. Cancer, we command you to leave their body in Jesus' name. Sunny, uh, who's with us right now, is asking for prayer, updating prayer requests from the fall. Two youngest grandsons, Javion and Orion, uh, will be having surgery on Wednesday, January 25th. So this just happened. Um, <clears throat> digestive eating issues, uh, choke, uh, regurgitate when they try to drink or, and eat. So in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for healing. We thank you that the triple scope procedure, the bronchi bronchoscop bronchi bronchoscopy, the endoscopy, and the esophagus, stomach, and intestine, the salt suture augmentation, the biopsies, all of it in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for complete healing and restoration and that the great, great physician is actually the one doing all of these surgeries and these healings, recovery, restoration in the name of Jesus. Also praying for her daughter, Vanessa, to find favor in the name of Jesus. We continue to pray. Marty and Deborah are also asking for prayer for their business, increase in their business. Uh, they've been given a cutting-edge ministry vision, asking for favor with God and man in the name of Jesus. Also pray over their daughter, Mandy's husband, Alan, for health and spiritual improvement. So all of these prayer requests... We're bringing to you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hi, Connie. Yes, we're continuing to pray for Ginger, for Connie, and for Danny in the name of Jesus. Also, don't forget to pray for my niece, Mary Catherine, who is uh, being healed of COVID, even with the traumatic brain injury. She's been healed. So is my brother and my sister in love, Cindy and Tim. Please keep praying for them. Please continue to pray for my mom, for my husband. I know you all are, and we stand together in fellowship together. I brought my coffee today. It's a little cool in here. And I'm finishing up my coffee. Love is patient. Love is kind. Oh, my cup. Now, from Sefer Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, <clears throat> contains the prophecies of, Ezekiel received during the years, between the years 593 and 571 BCE. And if you want to, if you have a Spirit-Filled Life Bible, for instance, right before every book, it kind of gives the timeline, the dates on a book, and you can kind of see how many of them are very close in timeline or they are overlapping, like the book of Daniel and the book of Esther and, uh, and several others. Uh, Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah, all happening at the same time. So it's kind of nice to see the time frames and then sometimes read those books consecutively. Here, it's between 593 and 571 BCE. Since he provides exact dates for a number of his prophecies throughout the book, we can easily pinpoint the moment in history when they are delivered. Now I'm reading right now before this, um, in this Bible, the Israel Bible, this is just the overall about the book of Ezekiel before we jump into the chapters. Uh, since he provides exact dates for a number of his prophecies throughout the book, we can easily pinpoint the moment in history when uh, they are delivered. His messages are intended mainly for the Jews already living in Babylonia who were exiled from Jerusalem in 597 BCE and watch from afar as their Bethem Hamikdash, I want to say it right, Bet Hamikdash. Bet is the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Bet, and it means house. So the house of Israel and homeland in Yehuda are destroyed. In addition to his prophecies of rebuke, one of Ezekiel's central roles involves offering strength to these people who have been torn from the Holy Land. His name thus benefits his role as prophet, since Ezekiel means God strengthens, Hashim chose Ezekiel to give strength to his people. Ezekiel descends from a priestly family, and we read that when we first started this. After being exiled from Jerusalem, he lives in Babylonia, which would be modern-day Iran, in the city of Tel Aviv. This is not Tel Aviv. This is Tel Aviv, which... Um, <clears throat> is in modern day Iran, it's in uh, this ancient day Babylonia. His messages of rebuke 
fall mostly on deaf ears as the Jews in Babylonia refuse to believe that Hashim will destroy his holy city of Jerusalem and his temple. They can't believe it, no matter how bad they are, and they know they're awful, but they just don't believe that he will destroy Jerusalem or the holy temple. They also do not accept his words of reproach, justifying the upcoming tragedy. Ezekiel's warning them, and all they would have had to have done was repent, and the hand of God would have stayed. But they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't even believe him. After the traumatic destruction, however, the people have become ready to listen to Ezekiel, and the focus of his message changes. This is why I wanted to read this to you. Because we are already in verse in chapter 7, and I'm already like, oh my gosh, are we ever going to get out of these horrible destructions and these horrible words? Yes, we will. And I, I want you to know that. Instead of emphasizing the catastrophe and its causes, he begins to outline a plan for the Jewish people to survive the temporary loss of their land and to prevail in exile. Now, when God says temporary, to us it seems forever, but to God he calls it temporary. His messages refer equally to the ritual and the ethical, and he delivers a message of hope that echoes to this day. Now, we know one time frame is 390 years, and another one is 40 years. So we're talking about 430 years that they will be temporarily out of position. Now, it says he delivers a message of hope that echoes to this day. We're obviously not in those chapters yet, but we will get to them. Ezekiel, which is organized chronologically, so from beginning to the end of the book, is in order. They're not all, but Ezekiel is. It's, it's organized chronologically, can be divided into three major sections. This is what I wanted you to hear. Paralleling the historical events which unfold around the prophet, chapters 1 through 24, and we're entering seven today, speak of the judgment that will befall Jerusalem and provide an explanation for why God has chosen to chastise his people so harshly. The punishments are meant to cleanse his people from their accumulated sins so they can return in purity to their... See, what is the point? All of these chastisements are meant to cleanse his people from the accumulated sins so they can return to purity to their land. In that vein, that actual destruction of Jerusalem is compared to an offering on the altar. So God, in destroying Jerusalem, is actually offering it up as a sacrifice for the sins of the people. The second section, beginning in chapter 25 through 32, outlines a series of judgments. Whew, it's a rough book that will befall the nations of the world, not just Jerusalem, but the world, either for actively helping Babylonia destroy Jerusalem or for reveling in the downfall of Israel. So you might not have destroyed Israel. You might not have destroyed Jerusalem. You might not have even helped them. But if you reveled in it, if you laughed about it, if you thought it was wonderful, then that will bring judgment. Included among these nations are Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt. The third and final section, glory to God for the third and final section, chapters 33 through 48, provides hope for restoration of the exiled remnant of Israel. Ezekiel promises that they can and will return as a sovereign nation to the Holy Land, and we know they did return to the Holy Land as a sovereign nation in 1948 not so long ago. This message of deliverance, I believe it was May the 14th, 1948. This message of deliverance and restoration can be further subdivided into two parts. Now, I'm not saying that they weren't a people. I'm not saying that they weren't the house of Israel. They were, but they became a sovereign nation recognized by all the world in 1948. So I want you to see prophetically things sometimes are said and, and, and the hope is given and the restoration is assured, but it may be hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years. This message of deliverance and restoration can be further subdivided into two parts. Chapter 33 through 40 describe the return of the soil of the land. And remember, uh, 37 is in that. And the final eight chapters envision the rebuilt Bayat Hamikdash, which is the rebuilding in all of its glory 
uh, first Jerusalem, the holy city, and the temple, and the messianic age, which would be the thousand year reign <clears throat> that um, is prophesied we know about. It will happen after the seven years of tribulation. Then Jesus will come back and those of us will come back with him and uh, the, the, the war will happen and then Jesus will set up his rule and reign on the earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Jerusalem and the 1,000 year reign will begin at that time. Most famous re revelation can be found in this section, the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones in chapter 37. <clears throat> Ezekiel is full of unusual symbolic acts and allegories which are intended to help the prophet convey his messages. For example, Ezekiel is told to lie down on his side. We've already had this for over a year, 390 days. He's also told to lie at the left side, then his right side, 40 days. Then he's told to shave his head, shave his beard, save the hair, refrain from mourning for his deceased wife. We haven't gotten to that yet. Ezekiel's extravagant, otherworldly descriptions of the heavenly chariot and court become the focal point for study of many esoteric mystical traditions. These pursuits have been considered spiritually dangerous for untrained, and now this is coming from a rabbi, or unprepared students, and studying these chapters was traditionally discouraged for the Jews, except under the guidance of a master, so that they didn't get confused. In fact, there are many who felt that it was not appropriate to include Ezekiel within the biblical canon. The rabbis, however, I find this so interesting, chose to include Ezekiel as it was deemed an authentic prophetic work whose eternal messages are meaningful for all generations. And we know that this is true because so much of what we read about now in these early pro prophecies in the chapters uh, have already happened, much of it, and now we are coming into the restoration and the we, we are into that part of it and we will soon be in through the messianic age and as my my mentor billy brim talks about the church age which is the last two thousand years since jesus came and then of course we have the setting up of jesus kingdom on the earth for the thousand years thousand year reign so let's jump into chapter seven the word of hashim came to me you O mortal, say, thus said Hashim to the land of Israel, doom, doom is coming upon the four corners of the land. And everyone knows, if you've been to my schools or if you've studied tones of the throne room, that four means the earth. So we're talking about the earth. We're not talking about the universe. We're not talking about the world at large. We are talking about the earth. Uh, hi, Sunny. Thank you for uh, doing writing those out for me. Hi, Van. I just talked about you. Uh, Marnie, Abby, good to see you. Jesse, always praying for you. Abby, Kendi, nice to see all of you joining us today. <clears throat> now, as I jump into chapter 7, I want to make sure I'm reading it properly. Now, speedily, making sure the word of the Lord came to me. I don't want to jump ahead here. That's verse 8. I've got my notes all over both of these books, so I want to make sure I'm reading it properly to you. Right out of the translated Hebrew, the word of Hashim came to me saying, As for me, Ben Adam, thus says my Lord Hashim Elohim, to the soil of Israel. Ooh, now he's talking to the land. An end. The end has come upon the four corners of the earth. And to the soil of Israel, an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the earth. The word an end comes from the root word repeated five times in verses 2 and 3 and verses 6. is used in order that the similarity between it to awake from the root or should create an association with the idea of an awakening. So when God speaks to the land here, he's talking about Yes, it sounds like he's cursing the land, but he's also commanding the land to awaken. Uh, such a patterned use of words, uh, as I said, are, it's said five times in verses 2, 3, and 6. With similar sounds, is common in scriptures regarded as a splendor or beautification of the language. Our translation follows the cantillation, which includes the words to the soil of Israel as part of the message to the people. An end is coming to the land. An alternative would have, would have been to interpret the phrase as a salutation, that the message was addressed 
to the telling the dress address to the land telling the land i'm trying to skip through and read the hebrew as best i can address to the land telling the land that an end was at hand in contrast to an end without the definite article in the first part of the sentence the end of the second part implies a specific known end the verses when you shall beget children and children's children and you shall become old in the land and will practice depravity and make an image the representation of anything at all and will do that which is evil in the eyes of Hashim your God to provoke him to anger I call heaven and earth to witness against you this is out of Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 25 and 26 he says I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will be lost quickly lost from the land to which you crossed the Jordan to take it into possession. So as you can see, when he brings a judgment upon the land, now it goes on to verse 2, I mean verse 3. Now the end is upon you, and I will send my anger against you and punish you according to your ways, and I will place upon you all your abominations. And let me just reiterate, at any point, they could have repented. But they refused to believe that God would bring this kind of judgment, that he would destroy his beautiful city of Jerusalem, that he would destroy the Holy Temple. But he kept telling them, you, you don't understand. I'm not about buildings. I'm not about a city. I'm about you. You're my people, and I want you back. Oh, I hope you can be with me tomorrow. I really have a word from the Lord in my spirit about Father and how he, he will move heaven and earth to get us back in right position as his children. Now, verse 4 says, My eye will not spare you, nor will I pity, for your ways will I place upon you, and your abominations will be in your midst. So nothing that God ever does is unjustified. It's totally justified, and he warns, and he warns, and he warns. God does never come in and bring a correction or a chastisement or a judgment without warning us over and over and over. He gives us so many chances to repent. Then you shall know that I am Hashim, he says. Thus, verse 5, thus says my Lord, Hashim Elohim, an evil, a singular evil. See, it comes. An evil has come. It has come the end. It is wakened against you. See, it comes. So here, when you read this in context, what he's saying is, what I'm having to bring against you, I'm having to wake it up to bring it against you. I'm awakening it, awakening it from the land. It's in the land, but it's been asleep. I've allowed it to be dormant. It hasn't come against you, but now you won't repent. So I'm having to awaken it from the very land that you live in and the evil that will come upon you. You're going to see it. It's going to be one singular evil and you're going to see it. The dawn has come against you, dweller of the land. The time has come. Close is the day of confusion, not the shouting of the mountains. And in verse 7 there, it says the dawn of the morning has come is contrast to verse 5 and 6. It's accentuated in the first syllable it's in the, and it's in the past tense. Here, <clears throat> Rashi David trace this word to the Aramaic root dawn or morning. The word recurs only in Isaiah 28 verse 5 where all commentators, with the exception of one, see below, render it as a synonym, a crown. Wow. Namely, a diadem. Based upon that rendering, Targum on our verse translates, kingship has come. Wow. Kingship has come, referring to the conquest of Nebuchadnezzar. Radic suggests for, that the basic meaning of the root, it means to surround. Thus the use in Isaiah as a diadem, that which encircles. The same association by which a cause is derived from to surround would also give the meaning of cause. He translates that which is happening to you by the providence of God. So you can see when it says not, and not the shouting of the mountains, that will be 
None who will escape to the strongholds of the mountains. Rashi explains that Targum arrives at this meaning by identifying the word with the cry or shout of encouragement mentioned in Isaiah chapter 16, verse 9. Would someone like to look up Isaiah chapter 16, verse 9? And in Jeremiah 25, verse 30. The literal meaning of the verse would then be, there will be no encouraging shouts urging the people seek the protection of the mountains. In other words, there's not going to be a lot. There's going to be no praise coming out of this. There's going to be no encouragement coming out of this. Radix sees the same relationship but renders it as an echo, meaning the phrase is that the sound coming from the mountains, hello everyone, we're talking about sound again, will come from a real enemy. It will not be an echo, which is a sound without a tangible source, but it will be a real sound of an enemy coming from the mountains to destroy. And that would be the singular evil that God is talking about here in the scriptures through the prophet Isaiah. Verse 8, Now speedily I will pour out my fury upon you, I will spend my anger against you, and judge you according to your ways, and I shall place upon you all your abominations, and my eye will not spare, nor will I pity, he said this again, in accordance with your ways will I place upon you. See, this is why it is important that we live correctly. We need to live correctly, not by rules and regulations, but by, by our heart. And our relationship with the Lord prodding us on to live faithfully, trustworthy, walking by faith and not by sight, living in right relationship with God, righteousness. The righteousness of Jesus is in us, right standing with God, Gabe Kokenauer. With your ways will I place upon you and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I, Hashim, strike. See the day, see it comes, the dawn has come forth, the rod has blossomed, arrogance has budded, injustice has arisen into a rod of wickedness. I don't think we need anybody to tell us what all of that means. See the day, see it comes, the dawn has come forth, the rod has blossomed, arrogance has budded, injustice has arisen into a rod of wickedness. Not from them, nor from their multitudes, nor from their children, for there is not one who seeks among them. Wow. So verse 11 there is saying that not one, for there is not one who seeks among them. That, heart, that just breaks my heart when you think about it. It just breaks my heart. To think, and there's so much commentary on that verse, I was just trying to pick and choose. It's like three pages, but the word appears in Scripture, injustice, as a term denoting general injustice and violence, and also a specific reference to theft or stolen objects, since property gained through theft has been obtained violently or unjustly. The use of... In, in our sentence here, and especially in the term in verse 23, creates an association to Genesis 6 verse 9, where God brings the deluge upon mankind because the land was filled with injustice. Now, let's keep reading. The time has come. The day has drawn near. This is verse 12. Let the buyer not be glad, nor let the seller mourn. For wrath is upon her entire multitude, for the seller to that which is sold, he shall not return, even were they yet alive. For a vision is upon her entire multitude, it will not return, each man with his sin, his very being, they can find no strength. Now that particular verse is dealing with the Jubilee year, which is the 50th year on the Jewish calendar, uh, seven sevens with the seventh year being the rest year each year. And then after that seventh, seventh year, then the Jubilee year happens. And normally in a Jubilee year, normally a person forced to sell his field would be sad at losing his property while the buyer would be happy. With the knowledge of an imminent exile upon them, however, the sale would have no real significance to either of them because they're about to be exiled from the land. That's what that verse is saying. 
for the seller shall not return in verse 13 that once exiled the seller will never see his field in another's hands therefore there is no reason for him to mourn having to return it Radic detects an association between the wording of our phrase and Leviticus 25, 13, where the law of Yovel, the 50th year, Jubilee, when fields are returned to their sellers is expressed in the words and interprets our verse, even when the Jubilee year comes, the seller will not return to his field because they're not there. They're exiled out of the land so neither the buyer or the seller uh, is having any kind of rejoicing here because nothing's going to reverse on the 50th year. That's what that means. Verse 14, <clears throat> they have blown the horn and prepared everything, but none goes to war. This, they have blown the horn here means to urge the people to make ready for war. However, the fear of the enemy will be so overwhelming that no one will have the courage to fight. Wow. They have blown the horn and prepared everything, but none goes to war. For my anger is upon all her multitude, the sword without, and the plague and famine within. That he that is in the field will die by the sword, and he that is in the city, famine and plague, will consume him. We've heard this before. And their fugitives will flee and be upon the mountains like the doves of the valleys, all of them moaning each of his in his sin all the hands will be slack and all the knees will flow water and all the knees will flow water they're wobbly and they shall gird themselves in sacks and trembling will cover them on every face will be shame and on all their heads baldness now verse 19 says their silver they will throw in the streets and their gold will be fit for discarding in other words it'll be worth nothing their silver and gold will be unable to save them on the day of Hashim's anger. <clears throat> now in verse 19, it states, uh, this could refer either to their idols of silver and gold or to their wealth. Neither can save them on the day of Hashim's anger. Whether they're wealthy or whether these are their silver and gold idols, neither will be able to save them. Then the enemy will be the famine, which is raging in the streets of Jerusalem, and money will be useless since there's no food available to purchase so fit for discarding the word derives from that which has the meaning of wandering or moving away thus would represent something from which one should keep his distance that's uh verse still verse 19 let me keep reading uh their silver and gold will be unable to save them on the day of Hashim's anger they shall not be they shall not satisfy their souls nor fill their bowels for it was the stumbling block of their sins. Verse 20 says, And the beauty of their ornament for majesty had he placed it. And of course, I, I'm immediately thinking of a scripture in Isaiah. Let's see here what it says here. Uh, the, and the beauty of their ornament. Agree that this phrase refers to the temple which God had placed in the midst as a symbol of majesty. It was the source of their pride because God's presence was manifest in it. They had defiled it by placing their own idols within its sacred confines. Therefore, God presented the temple as something to be discarded because they mixed their worship. We have to be very careful. He placed a distance between himself and the temple, delivering it into the hands of the enemy. That's when we would say, Ichabod, the glory of the Lord has departed. A totally different translation is suggested, refers to the silver and gold of the previous verse, and is to be translated their wealth. In addition, there is a play on words because an ornament has a sound association with testimony. So their sound of their testimony will be discarded. Wow. Wow. It will have no power. It will have no strength. It'll have no buying power. It can't convert anyone. It can't be converted into lives. It can't be converted into souls. Uh, in the interpretation, the phrase has the same meaning as of the previous verse. So let's keep reading. Their silver, verse 19, they will throw in the streets and their gold will be fit for discarding. Their silver and gold will be unable to save them on the day of Hashim's anger. They shall not satisfy their souls nor fill their bowels. For it was stum a stumbling block of their sins and the beauty of the ornament for 
majesty hath he placed it, the images of their abominations and their detest detestations they made in it by putting their own horrible images, idols, mixed in the temple of God. Therefore, we just have to be so careful of what we bring to the Lord every day and what we bring to the Lord when we corporately worship that we're not infiltrating um, modern day idols. Therefore, I presented it to them as fit for discarding and I will present it in the hands of the strangers for a prey, at P-R-E-Y, and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil and they shall profane it. In other words, they can take it. And I shall turn my face away from them, and they will profane my hiding place, and into it will come the brazen and profane it. Verse 23, make the chain, for the land is full of blood guilt, and the city is full of injustice. And I shall bring the most wicked of the nations, and they will inherit their houses. And I shall put an end to the pride of the mighty, and that which should have hallowed them will be defiled. Now let's jump down to verse 25. I don't think any explanation, explanation there is needed. A cutting off has come, and they shall seek peace, and it is not there. Happening shall come upon happening, and news shall be upon news. Then they shall seek vision from a prophet. But teaching shall be lost from the priest and counsel from the elders. Remember, the temple is destroyed. The king shall mourn and the prince will be clothed with a palmet and the hands of the people of the land will be confused. Of their own ways shall I do to them and by their own judgments shall I judge them. And they shall know that I am Hashim. They shall know that I am the Lord. That's chapter 7. And I just encourage you to just, as I do myself, and I have been doing as we go through this book, I am checking my own heart. I'm making sure I'm not in judgment. I'm making sure that where I have any control over unity, that we're walking in unity, that we're not divided, that we're not bringing division, but that we are not tolerating sin, that we are praying, that we are staying on the wall, that we are believing, that we can be counted on by God to be his watchman on the wall, that we're not afraid to say what he tells us to say, but we don't say what we think. We only say what he says. Stay in love, operate in love, be filled with the Holy Spirit, pray more in the Holy Spirit than you do in English. Stay in the Spirit and you won't operate in the flesh. And that is truly the key. So, we've finished the first seven chapters. I'm going to give you time now to get caught up on them. Uh, if you need to go back, if you need to look up references, if you need to write things in the comments, please do so. Uh, it helps others when you write things in the comments. Uh, I appreciate all of you intercessors when I n name names to pray. You, you, you pray and you list it in the comments. That is so very helpful. And I just want to bless you as you are endeavoring to stay in this deep, difficult, hard word, uh, but it is going to shift once uh, there is a, a time frame in Ezekiel that the words will not be so hard and harsh to get through, but I'm taking each and every one to my own heart, and I'm bringing change in my own life. I'm staying in a repentant mode. I'm keeping my head down. I'm making sure my worship is pure. I'm making sure that I'm not pulled away by the world's ways. I'm making sure that I'm worshiping God with every sound that I make in the name of Jesus. I encourage you. I encourage you. I encourage you. I'm not discouraging you. I'm encouraging you. I encourage you to enjoy the presence of God more every day. I'm also encouraging you to give me a thumbs up and to hit that little share button and invite all your friends to watch these chapters as we go forth. And also know that I pray for you every day. And I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray that your relationship with the Son is beautiful and secure. I pray that you are so filled with the Holy Spirit that his fruit and the manifestation of his gifts are coming forth out of your life all day, every day. And then I pray for the baptism of fire upon you so that you take on the very nature of Father God. 
the very Father who loves and adores you more than we can ever imagine. And he wants to purify us and bring us into right relationship so that there is therefore now no condemnation to us because of how we walk with Son, Holy Spirit, and Father. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace today and every day. Now I'm praying for you. I so appreciate your prayers. I so appreciate your faithfulness. I so appreciate your partnership. You are a blessing in my life. I love our little online church here. It means so much to me, and I hope it is a blessing to you as well. I'll see you very soon. Thank you.